The Apostle Paul writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This text, of course, comes at an uh, extremely important part of Paul's letter to the Romans. The text in Romans has laid out in Paul's most expansive, cosmic-minded way, a portrait of the God of creation, a God who intersects with not only the origins of our life coming out of the being and life and creativity and imagination of God, but a God who then persists with creation over time in its crisis and in its longing for hope all yearning toward something that I want to think of this morning as groaning beauty. This is the space that we live in. This is the only world that we know. We only know a world that groans toward beauty. Hans von Balthasar, one of the leading theological aesthetics experts that has reflected on these things uh, for uh, in years past, said that the cross is beauty that the cross is the vortex of beauty, which is and must be in a fallen world, a beauty that intersects with and demonstrates itself right in the context of the groaning and the suffering. Let all beauty take its reference from this. Let beauty understand its core definition as this tension between some kind of magnificence and glory, but that glory known in vulnerability, nakedness, pain, suffering, and confusion. This is the artist's narrative. This is why artists are so seminal to the world and so seminal in the life of the church. Because in fact, we need people who are going to claim and stand and name and create out of groaning beauty, the things that enable all of us to find a language that actually enabled us to move uh, into this final and great hope. One of the things that the fellows and I have been developing is this phenomenon of kintsugi. It's the uh, it's an extraordinary tradition that Japanese um, crafts folks of old has developed. Uh, it came out of the tea ceremony tradition, um, and there are several anecdotal stories. But one one is this story of the warlord uh, Hideyoshi who had a, a very important ball that he was um, having the younger uh, apprentice uh, help the tea master to serve. And the tea master was one of the disciples of Senrikyu, the 17th century master of uh, tea that we think is connected to the Eucharistic tradition that the Jesuit missionaries are bringing into Japan and so forth. But this young apprentice brought the this important ball uh, for the tea ceremony, and he dropped it. Um, and he knew he was going to get punished, uh, maybe his life, <laughs> for his life. But then, then the tea master began to sing a song. And this was a, known to be this waka from 11th century that invoked 
this idea of compassion, an idea of new creation, actually, that it's embedded in Japanese poetry in, in a very lyrical sense. And, mm. and Woro actually got it, you know? <laughs> that, I mean, huh? what dictator would get this? I, uh, the Japanese, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and, and so... <laughs> you can't sing to all dictators, but no, Japanese but, dictators... But Japanese, Japanese dictators <laughs> will actually get the 11th century waka that you sing <laughs> elusively, and you get, you know, oh, okay, I will not punish the hands of the one that failed, uh, failed me. And months later, the, uh, the team master came back to the world and brought back a ball that has been fixed and restored. But as you know, it, it's Kintsugi is more than restoration and more than fixing. Kin means gold and Tsugi means to connect. But Tsugi also means to connect generationally. So this idea of passing on this, not just fixing the brokenness, but to create something new. And the Kintsugi balls are far more in worth and value than the original. <laughs> because of that, that, trans, you know, that translation, uh, the action that happened, um, kindness of the master to think of the apprentice, uh, the power of poetry to speak into the divine. What, what does it mean to you as a preacher uh, and now a president of a seminary <laughs> um, to be able to live in that zone that artists often will take themselves to, that, that area of vulnerability and, and risk-taking? Fundamentally, I think the, the risk-taking has to do with whether or not it's really a, a truth-telling, whether it's authentic to yeah. the, the re human experience, and whether, um, from a theological point of view, it's able to be held and, and uh, correlated to a much larger reality of what is going on. Because in Paul's text, there's this interesting combination isn't there between a groaning that is in travail and a groaning that is actually the work of the Spirit's prayers. So there's this kind of um, intertwined connection between a work of the Spirit and the work of our own human frailty and vulnerability. This is one of the reasons uh, why I always say, yeah, I just can't trust art that isn't groaning. So um, one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of Thomas Kincaid is because um, <laughs> is because there's not enough groaning. I don't know I don't know what that world is. It it feels um, I know that I'm assuming in his own imagination it was for him an expression of a kind of quiet and peace and beauty. But it's not the kind of quiet and peace and beauty that I actually hunger for. Um, that's why I like your paintings, Mako. That's why I'm uh, I can make more sense. Uh, out of many um, pained artists than I can make out of a pristine world. What is our path of cultural care? What is our path knowing our past, knowing there's so many brokenness, like the Kintsugi bowls, we, we, um, we, we, we there, there has to be a way to talk about this. But as you noted, the imagination is, is not being discussed in, in the church. So, so how do we begin that journey? This coming Sunday, in many liturgical calendars, which is Transfiguration Sunday, um, which is, the Transfiguration is a really underappreciated resource, I think, for thinking about culture <laughs> and culture care. Um, I think it's safe to say that. Uh, <laughs> and here's the thing. Uh, so it's, of course, about the revealing of Jesus in his full glory. But there's this interesting detail that only Luke gives us. Um, so Jesus is, is transfigured. He's talking with Moses and Elijah, the disciples are kind of barely able to stay awake and engaged, but they realize it's Moses and Elijah, and they must have overheard what he's talking about because Luke knows to tell us. 
And Luke says, they were discussing, does anyone know? It's interesting, we don't know this, and it's not commented on often. They were, this is the phrase from Luke, they were discussing his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That's the language of the Gospel of Luke. In other words, Jesus alone, um, among this band of followers, uh, most uh, he keeps trying to tell them that he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. They do not believe it. They won't receive it. They rebuke him for it. Uh, but he knows he's going. And how is he going to have the resilience to, in the phrase that Luke uses, set his face to Jerusalem, to head into the brokenness of the cross? He has this encounter <laughs> with two who actually know. Moses and Elijah know. And that's what they're talking about. As he's revealed in this incredible glory, what they're talking about is his entry into, into hell, really, into the absolute worst of, of the human story and, and life on earth. And I think it's the one moment Jesus needs as a human being to prepare himself to fully enter into his vocation is he's got to have, in this case, two other people right. who will talk with him about that and who from their heavenly vantage point, we might say, understand what he's about to endure. And, um, and it's enough uh, for him then to be able to go and, uh, and carry out his mission. Um, because he had no ordinary humans to talk about. He has to go for glorified humans. <laughs> but like even the son of God, to maintain that vocation into the face of brokenness has to have companions. And so uh, when you ask that question, I immediately thought, you need community. How is the church going to do this? We're going to have to bring uh, whatever our own story is, both history and vocation, kind of future-oriented mission of brokenness into community with others. Um, and have it held there and transformed and remade Kintsugi style into something that, that is of great worth and that we're willing to give our lives for. <laughs>